welcome everybody to the LSA on Thursday, March the 7th, 2024. Um, uh, delightful to see you all flooding into the room. Um, my name is Samantha Hardingham. I am the academic director at the LSA uh, and um, have the great pleasure of hosting these Thursday talks, um, all of which are presented by members from our practice network. Um, so we are really, uh, it's a real privilege to see and uh, witness such an extraordinary range of subject matter um, across the weeks. I think we are, um, well, we're, we're well into term two now. I've completely lost count. I don't know how many more we've got, but we're, st we're just going to keep going. And they do get uploaded to our website for, um, sorry, not our website, to our, our internal um, site for any students who who do want to to see uh, talks in the future or or can't be here today. So um, it's an amazing resource. Um, just to remind everybody where we went last week, we we heard from Kartik Rajput um, from PRP who talked and, and gave us an incredible technical lecture about um, overheating homes and how we can reduce the overheating of homes. So it was very specific, um, but an incredible toolkit uh, for anybody uh, trying to work with that. I suspect it's on everybody's list and agenda um, to have to think about. So uh, do do check that out, that that work. It was an incredible um, introduction to, to strategies around around the overheating of homes. Next week, we are going to hear from DISC Collective. Um, this collective have worked with us this year at the LSA, um, leading on one of our think tanks, um, which is just a, a module that's just coming to its uh, conclusion currently. Uh, DISC Collective will uh, talk about cripping architectural pedagogies. Yes, cripping, um, which is a word I have to say I haven't come across yet, so I'm going to learn a lot about it, um, what it means. Uh, cripping architectural ped pedagogy, value, spaces, experiences, and histories. So please do um, check in with Disc Collective next week. Uh, they've done some amazing work on... Um, uh, 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 nighttime um, access to London uh, uh, in the think tank. So really look forward to hearing from them. But this week, um, we have uh, the great pleasure of welcoming Ronan Morris, director at Right and Right. Um, I think already, given the number of people that are in the room, um, there's a, a keen interest on the subject matter that Ronan is going to talk about today, sustainable architecture in heritage settings. I know there are many projects in the studio at the moment that, that are addressing exactly um, that subject matter. So looking forward to hearing from you, Ronan. Um, uh, Ronan has, uh, will provide insights on how highly sustainable contemporary architecture can be delivered in historically sensitive settings, focusing on retrofit approaches and the challenges of grade one listed buildings. Um, his talk will outline how to limit both operational and embodied energy. Ronan is a director and a certified passive house designer at Right and Right, with particular expertise in delivering sustainable architecture in challenging and historic settings. Uh, he has been an integral uh, member of the team delivering recent projects at uh, both the Museum of the Home, just down the road from us here in East London, and Lambeth Palace Library in London. Um, so without further ado, I will pass over to Ronan. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will say to everybody, please don't forget to put questions in the chat. I will try to field those questions um, in about 45 minutes. Uh, so um, look forward to, to hearing from you all in a little while. But over to you, Ronan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for that nice introduction, Samantha, and thanks everyone online for joining. It's nice to see some familiar names there. Um, so I've obviously Ronan, Director at Right and Right Architects. So I'll just quickly share screen to get the slideshow up and running. Um, so a little bit right and right to start. Um, we were founded in 1994 and are based in Camden in London. We're a practice of uh, about 28 people and a very friendly bunch. We specialize in education and cultural projects. So 
part of our aim in our work is to hit a num among a number of themes. So we want to create architecture that's contextual, while functioning, low energy, and built to last. So some of the themes that recur in our work um, include new into old. So you can see in our projects here at the top uh, left for St. John's College in Oxford and another for Corpus Christi. Uh, we like to detail our facades heavyweight and thick skin. So we, uh, we use stone, we use brick, we use long-lasting durable materials. Uh, we really emphasize that our spaces have a relationship to nature. So you can see again, the reading room uh, at the top at Lambeth Palace Library and the seminar space at St. John's. Um, we, we built to last and love stitching into the city as exemplified by our recent project at the top right here at the Lamba Palace. And finally, we look to use modern methods of construction such as passive house design, CLT and other natural building materials to ensure our designs are all low carbon. So today I wanted to take you to two, two projects that both address sustainability and heritage, but in very different ways. So one is a completed project, a radical reinvention of the Museum of the Home in East London. Um, here we fit 90% of the museum's brief into their existing grade one listed buildings through a careful retrofit first approach. On the right here, you will see uh, St. Edmund Hall. Um, so this is a project for student housing that's going to be low energy in a conservation area within Oxford. So this project consists of three new buildings alongside the retrofit of an existing Victorian villa. So I hope the two, uh, two uh, projects can illustrate very different but uh, sensitive approaches to sustainability. So these projects provide a broader reading of sustainability and how it informs our projects. Um, so we want a reading that not only dwells on energy consumption and embodied carbon, but also considers social and financial sustainability alongside landscape and biodiversity. So all of these are key issues we as architects need to grapple with and respond to today in light of the dual climate and biodiversity crisis. So I hope that both projects illustrate differing but sensitive approaches to creating distinctly contemporary low energy, energy architecture in heritage settings. So first then to the Museum at Home. Um, the museum has a unique collection telling the story of domestic life through room sets and everyday objects, um, as well as revealing the history of the, the home. The museum has extensive public programming to engage and debate contemporary topics of home, such as homelessness, food equality, immigration, and the future of the home. Um, the home is uh, the Museum of the Home is located very close by in next to Hoxton Station in Hackney. And it's free to enter and set in a series of stunning public gardens. Um, the galleries are housed in a beautiful tree-sided set of 18th century grade one listed almshouses. So this year on the right is the, the front Georgian facade of the building. Uh, to the left, you can see the, the images of the rear garden and then the plan just showing the three almshouse wings set around inside uh, this central garden. So this is a closer look at the, the building, so that iconic Georgian frontage. Um, you can see the plans here to the left and then to the right, um, it just a, a plan illustrating that each one of these uh, were an individual home um, within, the, within the overall range. So a little bit about the history of the site. In 1614, this area would have originally been a, a farmland along a drover's road um, in the hinterland of London. In 1714, a set of almshouses were created to house elderly residents associated with the city's ironmongery guild. So the almshouses were built by money bequeathed from Robert Treffery, a colonial trader. Um, so that's something the museum over the last number of years have been grappling with in terms of, of that legacy. Um, the front door in each of uh, the buildings that we can see here would lead to two three-story homes on either side of the front door um, with living space at ground level, a bedroom space above, and then utilitarian spaces at the basement level. So as the city expanded, the almshouses were relocated to a coastal location in Kent, and the buildings were threatened with demolition due to the ever-expanding kind of city centre of London. So thankfully, in 1914, the local council bought the site, furniture into the heart of Shoreditch at that time. Um, unfortunately, at that time of the conversion, a lot of damage was done to the buildings. So a lot of the original fabric was lost. They removed the first floors and made structural adaptions to the building that have destabilized it over time. 
So in the 1930s, uh, the museum shifted its focus to home and domestic life and created a period of living room sets along its ground floor, which you can see here. Um, the first floor and the, the lower basement floors were chock-a-block full of collection storage. Um, it was leaky, um, ill fit out and just not very good modern day kind of standards for, for collection storage. Um, so when we uh, won the competition in 2014, we found a much loved museum, but one which was at immediate risk of serious deterioration due, due to these adaptions from over the years. So only the ground floor of this building was really publicly accessible with the with the rest back of house space. Um, additionally, the museum um, owned a former pub building on the corner of the site. So this being the main museum range here and this being the, the, the location of that corner um, building on the site. So um, this was a beautiful pub, as you can see kind of here on the right in its heyday, but when we found it, it was very much kind of lying in a derelict state. Um, so immediately we saw some potential there. So some of the challenges we encountered with the museum, um, there was a, a fail scheme from a previous architect that uh, her planning permission had been refused and that centered around the proposal to demolish the, the corner pub, which um, proved very controversial with local interest groups. Um, I mentioned that the structural adaptions of the building over the years had led to a number of issues. So you can see here, just not very fit for purpose kind of store spaces, low door heights and lots of ad hoc strapping being added to the buildings. Um, because the ground floor of the buildings were the only publicly accessible area, the, there was a lot of visitor congestion. So the, these buildings were designed as cellular residences, not, not as a kind of free flowing museum. So that was something that we really needed to alleviate. Um, the costing, kind of a climate for cultural institutions is very complex and challenging. So the museum were aiming to have a lot of the funding provided by the Heritage Lottery Fund. So that involved a lot of bid work to get that in place. And the museum also had to contribute uh, match funding uh, to make sure that the project could get off the ground. Um, the, the site is very archaeologically rich. Um, back in the day in, when it was converted into a museum, the, the residents of Hackney were invited to dump all of the rubbish into the front gardens to build up the levels. So um, there was lots of areas in the site we didn't want to have to dig in, and uh, there was a lot of archaeological works uh, that was needed. And then something we all know about COVID happened during the middle of construction and ultimately delayed the museum um, reopening. So it was, a, it was a challenging build period as well as, as these other factors that we were grappling with. So where there's challenges, there's opportunities. Um, the first one was to rebuild the museum's relationship with the, the local community and local interest groups. So to get any scheme um, off the ground, we needed to talk closely and consult with a variety of heritage bodies, local interest groups. So that was a really important part of the process and actually really valuable in terms of informing the design. Um, we saw a chance to stabilize the building. So this is a photo of the, the building on site where we did things like reintroduce first floors to add robustness to the building so that the, the museum could continue really for, for decades to come. Um, we discovered we could reuse a lot of the, the existing buildings. So 92% of the project is retrofit. So true, true reopening the lower and the upper floors in the building, we could ease visitor congestion and uh, ease access into the museum. To address some of the financial kind of um, challenges with the museum, um, we, we renovated that pub building, but we also added a block of 10 flats onto the side of the pub um, and that enabled uh, a capital receipt that could be put to cross subsidizing the museum project. So the funds from the, the housing actually were the thing that enabled the, the project to get off the ground. Um, we saw opportunities to tell the building story. So the museum have a wonderful collection, but the, the story of the buildings in and of itself is, is, is worthy of kind of uh, display. Um, so we found areas in the building and ways that we could really bring the, the story of the building as well to the fore. And then lastly, to support the museum um, really in, in uh, financially and making sure that they have as much resource on site as possible. So things like introducing collection stores so that they didn't have to pay for offsite storage for their collections, introducing event spaces and so on so that they, they have another um, stream of income. So as well as obviously the environmental aspects and the retrofit first approach, it's looking at the broad kind of social and financial aspects of sustainability as well for, for the museum. So we really needed to unlock this site. So this is a, a bird's eye showing um, the overview of the site. So some of you may be familiar with it. This is Hoxton um, overground line here. So Hoxton station is, is just here. Um, 
so the museum brief required a new entrance into the museum directly opposite Hoxton Station, where about half of their visitors had been arriving. They would have been confronted originally by a, a solid brick wall here and had to actually make their way around the block to the front gardens to gain access to the museum. So opening up that entrance way um, was, a, was a key part of the brief. Um, the pub, the former pub building on the corner was renovated and we relocated the museum cafe to here to extend the museum's presence out onto the street. Um, we looked at retrofitting the entirety of this east wing of the building. So this was the, the almshouse building where, where we see, saw the previous drawings kind of shown, shown the, the uses over the years. So we realized through actually reusing this building that the, the majority of the brief could be um, accounted for here and it would result in a minimal amount of new build on, on the site. So the, the new build aspects where we needed larger spaces to people for people to gather were, um, the, were facilitated by the pavilion. So we have one pavilion here, the learning pavilion at one end of the garden, which is an educational space and another studio here, which was nestled behind the boundary wall, um, which was the event space and, and programming space for the museum. Um, so a big part of it was in increasing accessibility, both from the entrance, but as well around the garden. So that we, we introduced multiple points of exit from the building and, and um, entry so that really you can bring these amazing gardens kind of two to four and you can easily access those um, when you visit the museum. So a, a, another huge part of it was just leaving the museum in a good environmental state. So working with our friends, the engineers at uh, Max Fordham, we delivered all of this with no commensurate increase in energy consum consumption across the site. So again, leaving the museum with as, as little kind of bills to pay in the, in the years to come. So moving to take a little bit of a look at some of the spaces in particular, um, starting with the entrance. So um, this is the view that would now greet you as you arrive from Hoxton Station to the museum. So we set a stair on access uh, with that exit from the museum. We introduced benching um, along the public realm to allow places people uh, to gather um, outside even museum hours. Um, we've introduced new bold contemporary metalwork and um, striking kind of colours and signage uh, to aid wayfinding into the museum and, and bringing some planting to the front as well to soften that streetscape. So creating a direct connection between the museum and also a direct connection back to the, um, the corner cafe. So this is a view looking back towards Hoxton Station. So that kind of just re-emphasizes that the reconnection. Um, we introduced a set of sculpted ramps and that gets you level access in for those in a wheelchair or the elderly up um, up to the museum. The museum is also much loved with young kids. So lots of buggies and uh, skateboards and things make their way up along here over the over the over the days and years. Um, so it's it's been great to see kind of how that has really created a bit of a place out on the street and, and re-inhabited a place with life that was previously a little bit dull and um, built kind of not very well thought out. Um, you can see on the right here, the, the museum again, free to all. So, so during the day, you get people kind of pouring in the entrance here um, to the museum. And we've tried to bring a couple of things that might be familiar from front gardens out to the front of the museum. So introducing planting um, patterns that you might see on net curtains onto some of the balustrading. And then again, contemporary metalwork uh, to the front of the site, which kind of neatly doffs its cap back at the um, history of the museum starting as, as housing for the Ironmongers Guild in London. So here's a quick look at the, the cafe. So this is the former pub building. So the, the cafe has inhabited the, the ground floor of this. So we've done a, a shopfront restoration um, to that and introduced the housing element that I talked about above and to the side of the, the site. So this again brings the museum's presence directly out onto the corner, corner of the site. Um, and a, a view inside as well. Again, we've exposed as much of the heritage fabric in here as possible. So the old brickwork to add character. Um, into the into the spaces um, and uh, renewed things like timber flooring. So this is the new reception space in the museum. So after you come from um, the entrance from Hoxton Station, um, this is where the the entrance is the reception is located. So um, this was a 1998 extension to the museum by Branson Coates Architects. So this space used to house the museum's cafe. So by relocating the museum's cafe to the corner building, we've been able to introduce a new reception here that acts as the perfect nodal point from which to explore the site. So you get direct access um, to the galleries within the almshouse buildings, but also direct access to the, the front and back gardens as well. Um, it also left space for a new award-winning museum shop to be installed. 
and um, we introduced a new reception desk, new floor finishes, and then renewed all of the, the, the different finishes in the space as well, just giving you great outlooks to the adjacent gardens. Um, so I mentioned the almshouse as being key in terms of un unlocking the site and, and the reuse of this almshouse um, was such a key aspect of, of kind of the design. So uh, looking at the site before the project, I mentioned we there was only one floor accessible um, through kind of careful working with structural engineers, Alan Baxter. We found that the footings actually in the almshouse building were very deep. Um, so what that enabled us to do was dig down this lower floor of the almshouse building and allowed us to create a new run of galleries right away along the um, length of the building. We also added the first floors back in. These had been replaced with lightweight mezzanines. They were serving no structural purpose. So um, these first floors acted again to stabilize the building. Um, we added things like waterproofing to the basements, enhanced fire separation and acoustic separation, and um, carefully modeled the, the lighting um, to ensure there was no harmful kind of UV rays and things that were coming into the, the collection objects at the, at the lower floor. Um, so the, the reuse of the building really was, was key in terms of accommodating the majority of the museum's brief and it was through deep reading of this building that it, kind of the, the success of the project ultimately hinged. Um, so you can see here illustrated in 3D before the project, um, the, the public space is shown in yellow with the, the after project uh, space is massively kind of increasing the public space. So we, we increased the public space in this building opened over by 50% and really opened up a lot of the, the heritage aspects of the building that hadn't been seen by the public before um, for, the, for the first time. So one of the key things to ease uh, visitor kind of congestion was the ground floor reception space starts you on a clockwise route through the lower galleries and then back up at the end of the building to the ground floor. So this clockwise circulation route through the building was really key to kind of solving a lot of the issues that were, were plaguing the museum in terms of access and circulation. So you can see the new galleries here in, in the two images. These are called the home galleries and really celebrate the quirks of the old building. So you can see things like the old chimney stacks and uh, wash pots throughout these spaces. Um, so the new spaces have really been key in allowing the museum to tell new and ever more kind of diverse stories through everyday objects from the home. Um, so each of these rooms has a theme and is really a departure from the, the exhibits that existed elsewhere in the museum, which were room sets. So it's a, it's a great way of kind of new way for them of, of telling stories. Uh, we found a crib space below the, the chapel in the museum. So that the, the before shot here shows the crib space. So this was again, chocolate block full of collection and uh, it served as also the main plant room to the building. So we stripped out the boilers, um, we cleaned up the, the brick arches um, we removed all of the later additions and the space is now used for an immersive uh, soundscape exhibition, which abstracts familiar sounds from the home and intermingles it with a spoken word piece. Uh, so the space can also be hired out for events and directly connects to the museum gardens as well. So throughout the building, improving access uh, was a huge, huge part of it. So um, in the Elmshouse building, we've introduced new stairs and two lifts so that um, uh, the, the accessibility is able across three floors. So this is a shot of the ground floor reading room. Um, so this is a space that acts as an informal reading room and links upstairs to the, the formal collection study room um, for the museum. So we designed a solid oak staircase with hidden fixings like a giant piece of furniture. So this was again a nod to the museum's history as a, as a museum of furniture back in 1914. Um, we placed this stair in the position of the old almshouse stair, which would have sat centrally within each of the almshouses, but which had been stripped out over the years, so kind of evoking an echo of the past. Um, the stair has an enclosure, um, an oak lined enclosure around it, so um, we designed it with the idea that this could house books um, for that reading space and a kid's play area underneath the stair, so that's been really kind of successful and has really taken off in terms of um, the, the museum's programming and they've actually installed lots of temporary exhibitions in this space as well. So on the first floor, we created a collection study room. So the museum formerly didn't have anywhere where visitors could come in and, and study um, their, their collection. They've got a wide range of textiles, uh, posters, books, all, all dealing with the home. So we opened up the ceilings in this space. So there would have been plasterboarded kind of flat ceilings. Um, we opened them up to expose the original oak beams in the building where you can still see if you look closely when you're, you're in the room, the, the old carpenters marks from the, the 1700s when the, the beams would have originally been installed. 
So the space really is bright, airy, a, a lovely place in which to, to study the collection and then also has windows on both sides that connect you with views out to the gardens. Um, we did a complete remodeling of the museum garden. So the museum gardens at the, at the rear of the building are known as the gardens through time. Each one of the gardens is set to evoke a different period in garden design. So everything kind of from Victorian up to the present day. Um, so before um, we came to the project, it was a centralized narrow path. Um, what we've done is we've relocated the path to the side of the building and widened it to allow much better access for, for buggies and wheelchairs and so on. And it actually acts as a, a better kind of interpretation of the gardens themselves as you look into them as, as kind of sets in and of itself a little bit like what happens at the, the ground floor sets uh, of the living rooms. Um, so we worked with the museum garden team to introduce an array of kind of uh, planting, so massively kind of increasing biodiversity um, across the site. And um, really, it's 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 been great to see in spring and summer how how kind of verdant um, they're starting to look. At either end of this rear garden, we introduced pavilions. So the first one uh, was the learning pavilion that I mentioned was the educational space. So this provides space for um, school groups and community groups to come in and uh, use the building. So access can be into the uh, pavilion as possible via Jeffrey Street here or through the museum itself. So it can close down and act as a, a kind of sole functioning space within the museum. Um, so one of the key things for us was that these spaces had a really good relationship to the garden. So you can see there's, a, there's an array of doors here that open, um, open people out, bringing outside inside. Um, we introduced a clear story within the building as well to allow lots of natural light and ventilation um, into the space. So that's worked really successfully in terms of hosting and a number of different events for the museum. At the opposite end of the, the gardens here, we have another building which bookends the site. This is called the, the studio pavilion. So the studio is capped with a biodiverse climate resilient green roof. So that's very visible from Hoxton Station, which is on the right hand side here, but also the, the museum's reception. So we wanted this uh, green roof really to act as an extension of the, the existing gardens below, uh, with the idea that this could show people what a modern kind of underutilized roof space within an urban setting um, could do in both in terms of promoting biodiversity, but also giving really pleasant outlooks from the, the adjoining spaces. Um, so the space is, um, is a, again, a, a space that has direct connection to the gardens and it's incredibly multifunctional and has housed everything from theatre performances um, to dancing, yoga, classes and weddings. So it's proved really versatile and a, and a key part of the museum as well in terms of um, generating an income stream through being able to rent it out to the public. So a big part of uh, working at the museum has really been looking at materials and, and craft. Um, so where in the existing building, we've taken away some of the original masonry walls. We've inscribed bronze strips into the new polished grid flooring to evoke kind of the, the layouts of, of the past. I've mentioned about the, um, the use of oak in different areas of the museum to evoke its kind of history as a museum of furniture and to really get, get some craft um, and, and kind of fine joinery into the museum. And then lastly, the metalwork. So the, the museum's history as, a, as an Ironmongers Guild, bringing some contemporary metalwork uh, back to this site. So we worked with metalworkers in Dorset uh, to form all of the bespoke metalwork on the site. So it's it's really been heartening to see since the museum has opened that it's been a hive of activity with new exhibitions, volunteer and public programs, ever more diverse stories being told there, increases in biodiversity. And now we've we found that record numbers of people are actually visiting and that's continuing to climb. Um, so through this kind of careful stitching and weaving of all the new, we created a new cultural campus in the heart of Hackney which deliver social, financial, and environmental sustainability for the museum in a holistic sense. So it's left them ideally placed to continue to grow and engage audiences um, in the years ahead. And happily, we're continuing to work with the museum on a range of master planning and gallery projects that um, hopefully will come to fruition in the, in the coming years. So the next project that I'd like to talk about is St. Edmund Hall. So St. Edmund Hall, also known as Teddy Hall, is an Oxford college. Um, it's believed to be the oldest surviving academic society to house and educate undergraduates in any university. So it dates back to about the 13th century. 
So the college itself is one of the smaller Oxford colleges, but has big ambitions to be one of the greenest and most environmentally sustainable colleges in the city. So the college um, site here, the main site is in Queen's Lane, which is in the middle of the, the city in Oxford. Um, so they, identif they identified one of their sites in North Oxford as being the only one in their ownership that could take um, uh, buildings of the sort that would be suitable to house the number of students um, that required the accommodation. So one of the key kind of project aims was housing all of their undergraduates in college accommodation um, for, the, for the first time and releasing private uh, rental housing back to the general market. So there are a lot of housing pressures in Oxford. Um, so, so really accommodating students within college accommodation is a key goal for all of the colleges up there. Um, it also provides a financial stability for the students because the, the rents should be lower and, and controlled and then also a stream of financial income for the, for the college. Um, one of the big aims of the project was to create shared academic community spaces. Um, so that's something we'll, I'll speak a little bit about more later. And uh, the idea of so social sustainability was a big one. So small groups of cluster flats for student living um, rather than uh, massive halls. Um, so the idea that each person would have a, a dedicated kitchen and, and a place to share a meal together. Um, Number four here is just complementing the site's historic setting. So I'll talk a little bit about that now in a while, but it's located within a conservation area. So the college needed to be respectful of, of, the, of their, of their neighbours. And then the views and connecting to nature, that was one of the key goals of the project. It's in quite a lush green area of Oxford and we wanted to exploit that to the maximum of our capability. And um, the, the head of college is a world leading um, ecologist. So. Uh, there was a demand for an exemplar approach when it came to sustainability and biodiversity. So a little bit about the setting of the site. Um, so the site is here, uh, wedged between number 19 and number 15. Um, so the site is located in the North Oxford Victorian suburb conservation area. So that's one of the first conservation areas in the UK. So, so a site of kind of um, a spectacular site, but one that you have to kind of be very careful in terms of um, adding new buildings to. So uh, kind of some of the features that are characteristic of this area are quality residential housing. So these large villas would have originally been developed as single homes. Um, a lot of them over the years have been sold to the colleges and now house kind of academic institutions. Um, as you can see, there's a range of styles kind of employed on these villas. So you've got some Gothic features, arts and crafts and vernacular styles. Um, the area kind of is characterized by feeling very village-like in scale. Um, so there's lots of open space and a variety of materials that you can see in these images. So it's, the area is characterized by the use of brick, tile and stone to add, add real texture um, to the building stock. So the wider area, it's, it's abundant in terms of gardens. So both rear and front gardens um, are, are, are kind of prevalent in the area. There's a, a whole series of mature trees kind of uh, lining the streets. So uh, it gives a, a really kind of green sense of the area and a sense of kind of planned openness. And the the buildings themselves are characterized by red and yellow alternating brickwork. Um, we are bounding on the park side of the site. So this image here is just illustrating the fact that there's a very green backdrop to the site and, and the villas in the area. So uh, we always do a deep reading of the, the, the kind of adjacent buildings to get a sense of how these kind of features might be reinterpreted in a contemporary fashion in any new building. So these are some of the anal analysis sketches we looked at on the surrounding villas. So uh, things like dormers, bay windows, brick gables, chimneys and towers, they're all really prevalent on, on the street as you as you kind of travel through this area. And then another one was brick walls and front railings. So again, metalwork on, on the site and these beautiful kind of um, hedges. So these are some of the architectural elements really we, we were looking at to reinterpret in the, in the new buildings. So a little bit of a closer look at the site then. Um, this is our site here, bounded in red. So I mentioned the University Parks is just adjacent to the back of the site. Um, Norham Gardens Road here, which is lined with the, the villas that we've been looking at. Um, so some of the key characteristics when we looked at the site were that there were a number of high buildings on Norham Gardens acting as a bulwark um, against the street. So the number... 17 building here had been extended over the years in a less than sympathetic fashion to the surrounding conservation area. The, the views through the buildings really were one of the, the, the key things and, and some of the later additions have blocked these. 
Um, so within the gardens as well, um, there was an existing building, a low building um, uh, called the Brock Hughes Lodge. Um, front gardens to the street had, had predominantly been taken over by car parking and hard surface finishes. Um, there are a, a great mature kind of backdrop of trees um, to the site. So this was something that we were really keen to kind of exploit and make sure that all of the bedrooms had really good connections uh, to nature. And one of the key things was the villas were originally designed um, to have this outlook on the park. So keeping these views from the original number 17 villa and the original neighboring number 19 villa was a really key thing in terms of how we strategically set out the, the planning of the site. Um, the, the street has a pretty consistent datum in terms of building heights as well. So these are these are kind of typical of the, the surrounding villas and something as well that we, we wanted to respect in any new building. So moving to the design principles of the, the proposals, um, one of the things that we first wanted to do was reinstate the original number 17 villa and remove its later extensions. So to return this villa really to its free standing original fashion and, and carry out a deep retrofit of that building. Um, to the, the first of the buildings on the site is called the Villa Building, uh, labeled number two here. So this building, we wanted to be similar in scale and height to the, the surrounding uh, villas on the on the streetscape. Um, and then we wanted to add two new low buildings into the garden. So this one being Park House that has these outlooks onto the park and West House, which spans from the street back to the park side. So all of the, the new buildings address uh, different aspects of the garden spaces. We wanted to maintain the views through from number 17 and number 19 um, to the park. The access to the site would be improved and controlled by kind of one main entrance via a secured staffed entrance. We wanted to incorporate um, communal space into the um, into the site. So one of the key things for us was um, having um, common rooms that opened out again at ground level to the gardens. So we've we've introduced those, and you'll see a glimpse of those uh, later. Um, and then really I mentioned sustainability was such a key kind of part of this project. So creating an exemplary climate change biodiverse garden for the future. Um, so distinct kind of outside spaces of different characters as well was such a key kind of point. Um, and the, materially on the buildings taking cues from the buildings in these areas, I mentioned the, the brick and the tile, but also the pitch roofs, the dormers, um, introducing intricate brickwork detailing and, and hung tile. And a key part of delivering sustainably was building these new buildings to the, the passive house standard, which I'll speak a little bit about in a minute. So the environmental sustainability, to dig a little bit further into that one, um, we worked on this project alongside Max Fordham as well, who um, did the services sustainability and passive house um, design. So. Um, through working with them and our, our engineers, Price and Myers, we developed a couple of kind of key concepts for, for the project. Um, the first was to minimize embodied carbon through mainly the use of cross laminated timber structure and only using concrete where absolutely needed. And that minimizing of embodied carbon extends from the primary frame of the buildings, but right down to kind of things like the paint spec and sustainable alternatives to plasterboard. So a really holistic view at all of the materials that are being used on the project. Um, the second was renewable energy. So um, where possible, um, providing power from renewable sources. Um, so that, that took the form in this project of an air source heat pump and uh, photovoltaic arrays on the roof. So very careful, low energy kind of systems to, to power the buildings. Um, there's, a, there's an anticipation that all of the, the building's energy will be monitored in use so we can make sure that it's performing as designed. Uh, we paid close attention to waste management and construction, um, working with our contractor, and then in use in the buildings as well by putting things like composting areas outside the buildings. Um, we've specified an incredibly high performing building fabric, so really high levels of air tightness and insulation. Um, we're our key kind of ensuring that the energy demand in the buildings are, is kept very low. Um, we wanted to maximize biodiversity across the site by introducing the new gardens, um, conserve water on the site. So we'll be doing things like rainwater harvesting to allow um, the gardeners kind of a supply to maintain the gardens and also lots of kind of small things like low flow fittings and showers and taps. And then lastly, ventilation and health. So making sure that the building, the buildings themselves are really well ventilated. Um, so we've used the mechanical um, system to do that so that the buildings stay very um, stay very stable in the wintertime and there's a heat recovery 
on that system um so that you're getting uh you're getting kind of the the fresh air being warmed by the um the, the expelled kind of warm air from from the rooms and then within summer when needed there's purge ventilation available through the windows so um so ventilation being such a key kind of part of of uh, the the rooms and and stopping that feeling of overheating in the in the student spaces so a little bit about the passive design of the the new buildings each one of the the new buildings will be passive house certified so passive house um is a is a design kind of principle which was created in germany and has been around for about 30 years now so there's a couple of key principles in terms of passive house design. One is that you keep your building form very efficient. Uh, the second is that you have very, very high degrees of insulation to keep the building stable and the energy demand down. Um, similarly, the buildings are very airtight. Um, so you're not getting kind of leaks through your insulation in your building fabric that ultimately mean that the spaces take more energy to heat and, and, and cool. Um, in passive house buildings, it's imperative that you install triple glazed windows, again, to, to minimize any kind of heat losses and to make sure that you're not getting uh, too much solar gain in uh, times like the summer. And then the ventilation and heat recovery system. So the, the buildings um, stay very stable through providing um, optimal levels of ventilation through the ventilation system. And those ventilation systems run on a, on a, in a very efficient fashion. So the, the, the power used um, to, to, to power those is, is kind of um, is much reduced in comparison to if you if you didn't do a passive house building and, and you had the, the energy demand as a result of kind of increased heat losses and so on. Um, so that's the kind of passive house certification. So the, the one key thing about the passive house certification is that the, the building is modeled in software during the design to tell you if you're going to fail or pass. So there's an independent certifier that's brought on board to look at the buildings and, and make sure they're performing as designed. Um, so there, there's tests carried out on the building um, during construction at the end of construction and eventually um, if, if everything has been done correctly you get a passive house certificate so it's a great thing in terms of giving clients uh, reassurance that they're, they're kind of getting uh, essentially what they paid for and uh, reducing bills massively in many years to come so in terms of meeting um, net zero kind of energy targets the, the passive house design is kind of a tried and trusted um, route to that. Um, we did lots of kind of sustainable measures in the existing building as well. So this is kind of number 17. So we tried to take a lot of the passive house principles into the retrofitted villa as well. Um, so we've introduced insulation to the back of the solid masonry walls. So we're using a combination of thermal plaster and wood fiberboard um, to upgrade that. So the, the benefit of those materials is it allows the building to breathe in the way that it would have over the years. So you're not trapping kind of moisture within the walls. Um, we may, we're making this building very airtight as well through the use of kind of airtight membranes and introducing new services right away throughout the building as well to make sure um, the building performs efficiently. So a little bit about the cross laminated timber frame um, now as well. So I mentioned Price and Myers are the structural engineers in the project. This is an extract from uh, their three dimensional model of the villa building. So. The, the cross laminated timber construction is, is sourced from um, renewable timber. Um, so generally a lot of the companies are located in Austria or Germany and, and the forests around there too. So um, these are large scale timber panels um, that are glued together and, and they get dropped in by a crane on site. So they're a very quick, efficient, uh, dust free and less noisy way to build. Um, so the advantage of cross laminated timber construction in passive house is that it's a monolithic construction type. So you can see here on the image to the right, um, this is the outer face of the CLT panels. All of those panels are taped at their joints and the CLT itself, um, if specified correctly, is inherently airtight. So it's a great way of achieving very, very high levels of airtightness across buildings. And that's kind of been proven through projects over the, the last number of years. Um, I mentioned that to achieve the passive house standard, you have to test. So this is an airtightness test happening on a building where they seal up all of the openings and introduce um, a fan which tests the, the building under positive and negative pressure. And if you've got issues, some of your tapes kind of will blow. Um, so that there's an opportunity then to go back and repair those and ensure that everything is nice and airtight. So that testing happens a couple of times over the course of the build. It happens when the frame goes up. It happens when the first fix of the MEP is installed. And, and then at the end to, to get that, that, to get that final, um, uh, final approval certificate um, at the end of the build. 
So this is a view from uh, the street looking at the existing number 19 villa to the left here and the um, the new villa building to the right. So we're trying to take some of those material cues that I spoke about earlier and reinterpreting them in a contemporary fashion. Um, so the, the building is uh, to the street are characterized by brick and slate um, in keeping with the neighboring buildings. And we've introduced features like chimneys that actually don't serve the purpose of a traditional chimney, but root services, the, the height of the building. So trying to reinterpret some of these historic elements in a, in a contemporary way. Um, another view then from the opposite end of the street. Um, so you can see here, this is the smaller West House um, building. Uh, we've got number 17, the retrofitted villa, and then the larger villa building. So we're trying to maintain a street datum line in terms of heights, but also then alternating the materials. So you've got yellow brick, red brick, yellow brick, red brick, and uh, trying to keep that rhythm and really tie these buildings and ground them within the, the wider conservation area. Um, the front gardens are something that have been sadly eroded in the area over the years in favour of car parking. So we wanted to reintroduce some of the features that you see in the front gardens in the areas. So the low brick walls that I mentioned, introducing hedging um, that massively kind of improves biodiversity on the site. And then a lot of the metalwork reintroducing contemporary metalwork on the site. A lot of the, the metalwork in the area was removed and uh, melted down to aid the war effort back in the 40s. So reintroducing some of these features was one of the key things that the planners and conservation officers were really keen to see and was a real kind of plus in terms of the heritage aspects of the scheme, um, along with obviously introducing new new trees kind of here across the side of which you can see a few. So that gives you a sense of an old photo of, of the area where you would have had all of these elements kind of in play right the way across the, the conservation area. Um, so to student living then, the, the insides of the building. So I mentioned we wanted to arrange the students in cluster flats. So this here is one of the study bedrooms to the right. Um, so we wanted every bedroom to have ample, ample natural daylight um, and ability to naturally ventilate, getting these really great connections to kind of nature and the surrounding parkland and to also have um, lots of kind of fitted uh, furniture and, and things that um, really make it feel like quite a homely space full of natural materials. Um, the image here to the left is the, the kitchen and dining space. So the students are generally arranged in groups of say six to 10. Um, each of the kitchens is carefully sized to make sure that they can all sit down and have a meal um, together. And then accessible provision across the site is it was one of the really key elements. So all of the new buildings have lifts and each of the buildings has an accessible room um, for, for a student with those needs that they, they, they can be housed there. Um, it's something that the college are really keen to kind of improve because a lot of the colleges in Oxford are located in quite historic kind of context. So it's not accessibility is often one of the, the key challenges on, on their sites. So a, a new building here gives a great opportunity to, to address some of those concerns. Um, so to some of the shared spaces now, um, the, the common rooms were a key kind of part of the design. So there's a junior in the middle common room within the college. Um, so the this is a photo of the, or, sorry, a CGI of the junior common room, which directly connects out to the garden spaces and acts as a hub for um, students to, to gather and um, have events. Um, there was an existing uh, arts and crafts building on the site here located just adjacent. So the JCR is in number number two here in the new villa building and the middle common room is in the refurbished, um, refurbished listed building here, both opening out onto the gardens and the common rooms having a connection to the street as well. So a little bit of a deep dive into some of the more uh, material aspects of the designs and trying to create some contextual architecture. So true analysis of some of the existing buildings in the area, just number 19 here, the, the neighboring villa, for example, we, we realized there was a lot of recurring kind of features. So we wanted to introduce some of those. So I mentioned the, the brick detailing, introducing things like bands of brickwork um, to demarcate different levels, um, different soldier coursing details in the brickwork and really getting a tweediness into the into the brick facade to, to bring the buildings alive. Um, we wanted to take some of the stone detailing from the buildings and bring them through. So again, stone banding to demarcate floor levels, uh, stone keystones at the top of the buildings, just to celebrate that kind of end point of the roof. Um, we've taken handmade clay and slate um, roofing right the way across some of the buildings. So the villa building that faces the street is clad in slate on the roof with the, the garden buildings, the clay tile. So all of those clay tiles are individually made by hand with a handprint on the back. So quite an interesting process uh, goes into making those. And then 
really uh, defining features, the, the rainwater, the downpipes, the guttering on the buildings, making sure that they were really high quality and kind of in keeping with the cast iron, um, cast iron rainwater goods in the surrounding area. So these are just two base studies illustrating that on the villa building and then one to the right here on the garden building park house. The landscape design was a real kind of point of difference. And I think learning in this process in that it, there was a real emphasis on the landscape design and integrating that as much as possible with the architecture. So we worked with a landscape architect, Bradley Hall Shunak, on developing the, the landscaping proposals. And the three concepts that they came to the table with were really celebrating the arts and crafts movement. There's a, there's a great history of that kind of in the area and bringing that into the garden designs. Um, looking at biodiversity and climate change, so making a garden that would work as well now as it would in kind of 20, 25 years time as our climate warms and uh, gives an opportunity for lots of, of creatures to kind of inhabit the site as well. And then the third was usability of the spaces. So obviously the students being, being really key and, and their ability to get out into nature and into the gardens um, to relax the study. So that usability of spaces and making well-functioning different spaces was a really key aspect. So it really amounted to a series of outside rooms. So just to orientate ourselves, the Villa building is one of the new buildings, Park House and West House. So each one of the buildings has direct kind of outlooks onto gardens of, of different character types. So the village square here directly connects to the common rooms at, at ground floor, and that's a space for events. Uh, we have a cloister garden um, between West House Villa and number 17. So there's space for benching, a reflection pool, and some planters in the, the middle of that garden. garden. Um, we wanted a, a, an open lawn area that people could sit off and read a book during the summertime. So that's the site lawn here that directly kind of connects to the park. Um, and then one of the key parts that we wanted to introduce on the site is really an opportunity for ecology to thrive. The, the university parks itself is a, is a haven kind of for ecology. So we wanted to kind of blend or bleed the line between park and, um, park and uh, the, the college site and really promote ecology across both. So we've introduced a, a pond here that's dedicated towards um, ecology. So it's got rockeries and different marginal planting really to, to ensure that's kind of teeming with life and a, a walkway around the ponds to take you to and connect to number 19. So number 19 was out of our scope, but um, that's, that's the other existing building on the site that students live in. So connecting really this site to create a, a real student hub and student campus. Um, the front gardens are completely renewed, so introducing lots of new planting and shared bicycle spaces um, in the front gardens as well. Um, so this is a view looking across the ecology pond from the corner with University Park. So you can see the ecology pond here in front of us. So um, spaces really for students to sit and gather and, and kind of get in, get in contact with nature. Number 19 here to the right hand side, uh, Park House to the left. And, villa in the background so setting the terracotta buildings amongst amongst that kind of greenery and really a great juxtaposition of kind of uh, building and landscape the um this is the next view so this is the cloister garden so this is looking from the back of the existing number 17 villa so i mentioned it was really key to keep the connection between the existing villas and the park so that's why there's this space between the buildings that allows you an outlook to the the tree canopy in the park um, so the, the space here is the cloister garden. It has space for seating. Um, it has planting and it gives a great outlook for the, the surrounding kind of student bedrooms um, to, to look down upon. And we tried to relate this and scale back to the original um, college site in Queens Lane. So this is one of the quads in, um, in, in the, the college site and that you find kind of dotted around Oxford. So really a contemporary uh, quad for modern day student living. Um, a little bit about the in detail about the biodiverse design. So to, to really promote biodiversity on the site, there's a whole range of kind of planting types that have been used by Bradley Hall Shunnock. Um, so we've got trees, hedges, perennials, meadows, um, a woodland edge alongside the park. Um, and then th this overall contributes to an 89% uh, biodiversity net gain. So that was quite a, a, a difficult thing to achieve on a, on a site of this type, um, just because it was al already quite ecologically rich. So kind of working closely with the team, we've managed to get a really kind of successful biodiverse outcome. Um, a little bit further then on, on the biodiversity. So we, we selected specific trees that are endangered in the wild. So all of the new trees that are being placed on the site. 
are um, all, all endangered in the wild. And the idea that these can be propagated and very healthy kind of clippings can then be taken from, the, um, from, from those trees to propagate them elsewhere. We're using climbers um, across the buildings. Uh, we're enhancing ecology across the side through using small measures like um, bat bricks, uh, swift boxes, um, and invertebrate hotels even on, on the site. And then all of the new buildings are crowned with extensive green roofs. Um, so just a couple of quick images there of, of green roofs and other buildings. But the idea that each of these roofs will actually have a character in and of itself, uh, promoting biodiversity and kind of thinking about that sort of uh, fifth plane of your building, making sure that it's working as hard as it possibly can to, to work sustainably, really. And um, it also has the added benefit of attenuating rainwater and, and thermally insulating the buildings. So um, in summary, uh, the project is now on site and is due for completion in mid-2026, and we really hope it can be an exemplar in terms of a holistic approach to sustainability. Um, and then to wrap up, the, the, the scale really of the environmental challenges in the industry are, are clear today for, for both architects and other design practitioners. Um, there's going to be a lot of heavy lifting we need to do in the years ahead to meet net zero targets, but as architects and designers, we all have a duty to respond. Um, I think these challenges kind of should really excite. Um, we should be excited about the idea of creating architecture and landscapes that not only respect what has come before, but can also help us in, in safeguarding our future and really act to lift the human spirit in, in doing so. Um, so that brings the talk to a close. I hope you found it an interesting insight into our work and thanks very much for, for listening. Thank you so much, Ronan. Um, what an incredible, um, detailed and comprehensive uh, tour of two projects. Um, uh, it, it's because of their, comp their their sort of thoroughness with which you approached both of the, the descriptions, it leaves us a tiny bit of time for questions. Um, but but I'm going to try and I'm going to go straight to the questions that have come in to us. Um, and and try and answer one or two of them if we can in the next three minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask for fairly brief answers, uh, but but let's try let's give it a shot. So um, I think what I will go to first is what it, what is the biggest compromise when undertaking sustainable design in heritage settings? Do you think? Um, I mean, compromise is clearly the trade offs are going to be in there. Yeah, there 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 are kind of big trade-offs and I think it's a very complex process because you've got a lot of uh, kind of bodies that you need to talk to so you know on St Edmund Hall and actually Museum at Home as well we had to speak very closely with the local conservation officer but also Historic England and a huge array of uh, local interest groups so I think one of the kind of key challenges is in making sure that you think you're doing the right thing but you need to obviously bring everyone along with you on that journey and um, so certainly the consultation aspect and and, and working with these um, with these bodies to, to make sure that everyone kind of gets a good outcome. Um, probably one of the key challenges, I think, specific to St. Edmund Hall, um, passive house design has implications in terms of the building form, um, you know, the, the way that the building is detailed, you need very kind of thick walls and so on to get all of your insulation in. So um, trying to introduce very kind of low energy architecture into uh, historic settings, um, it, it, it means that you have to pay very close attention, I think, to the detailing of the buildings and making sure that they don't become too um, clunky in their approach and, and making sure that they fit in um, in the area. So they're probably two of the key ones that immediately spring to mind. Thank you. I mean, I think that sort of sets up the next question very well, which is was a really a request to run through some of the materials used in the retrofit parts of projects. I mean, clearly explain that where you start to get, you know, huge build up, that becomes really tricky. So yeah, just a, 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 and particularly in in sort of light of thermal efficiency of walls, roofs, etc. Could you tell us a little bit more about those materials? Sure. So within the number seventeen villa, um, we approached it very much with the passive house kind of principles in mind. Um, it's it's very different working in an existing building, obviously, to the new build where you, you can kind of start from carte blanche. So. We had existing solid masonry walls. Um, one of the key things with those walls is they've always been able to breed over their life. So, you know, they're not trapping damp and kind of moisture in the wall. It's just homogenous brick construction. So you have to be very careful that in adding something for a very good reason in terms of thermal performance and air tightness, you're not causing another issue in terms of trapping moisture in the wall. So the breedability of the, the materials which, which, which you upgrade existing buildings is such a key kind of part. So 
generally speaking, we lean towards natural materials. So I mentioned the thermal plaster that we put on the walls and um, that is derived from cork. Um, it actually acts as a very good moisture buffer. Um, it can take a little bit of moisture and then allow it to escape kind of naturally from the wall. Um, and, and with that as well, we've used wood fiber boards. So again, a, a, a board from a, a natural source, completely renewable. Um, so those are the two materials that we've used on the walls. Um, and then within the roofs, we've upgraded the roofs with a, a non-combustible mineral wool um, fill insulation. So um, you're a little bit more constrained in terms of what you can use with roofs, um, both from a, from a cost point of view, but then also a technical point of view. Um, so they, they're, they're the approaches that we've taken with, um, with, the, with the retrofit aspects, but the probably key lesson learned in terms of St. Edmund Hall is just that moisture question. And there's tools out there and practitioners um, that are available to undertake an analysis of that prior to kind of installing to make sure that uh, you're, you're by causing uh, you're by solving one problem you're not uh, causing another but um yeah it's a, it's a really kind of emerging interesting kind of field but one that is actually using materials and techniques that have been around for for centuries really that are kind of being rediscovered um in a, in a modern day kind of fashion Amazing. Um, thank you. I know I'm asking you to do this at high speed now. So it's, and there's so much detail, but that was really no big to start to point. Uh, um, I, I mean, it is, we, we have got to two o'clock, but there is one more question. So I'm going to ask it because it's quite an interesting one. In the university park, I, I mean, I have loads of questions about surprises you must have found in, in at the Museum of the Home, but we'll probably have to save that for another day. Um, but in the, uh, to go to this final question, is, is the university park accessible to the public? If so, how did the project maintain security between the back garden and the park? So that, that probably is something that didn't come across very clearly in the in the presentation. The university park is is public and we do have a we do have a secure kind of boundary along the, the student housing and park, but we, we have happily have a little laneway just adjacent to the right hand side of the site on plan that, that gives you perfect access kind of to the park. So though not directly physically linked from the garden into the park, they they're they're a very close shot. Mm. Great. Thanks so much. Well, look, um, our hour has whizzed by and um, thank you again for, for presenting such a, a, a comprehensive uh, amount of information on incredibly complex projects. Um, and thank you all to, uh, jo to uh, who have joined us today, um, Ronan and Right and Right. Good luck with the rest of the project in Oxford. Um, and uh, I hope it, it, it is successful. I had a question about post-occupancy uh, evaluation, but we might come back to that another day um, as well. I hope we will also welcome you to the LSA sometime soon. Um, that would be terrific. Uh, to the actual building, not the online one. Sounds great. Thank you, Samantha. Great. I will see you all next week, I hope, um, for this collective. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.